of you have put in the, the reviews. You can see what I'm saying. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the, the thing that, so basically what I'm gonna do is kind of go, I mean, the three papers that I'm going to read are three points in a spectrum of learning dynamics models. And I'm gonna try and situate them in a, Larger spectrum with many other things that you can read, um, starting around that. And I'm going through, as I'm going through that, hopefully it will make more sense to you because you've read the three papers. And if you have specific questions about any of those papers that you wanted to bring up, please do. Um, okay. So that's what we are uh, going to do. And then I was hoping that the, the second part, I actually am going to change that and get into the temporal planning because, again, I think one of the things you'll see is that under the word planning, there are very, very, very different kinds of problems. There are long stacking problems, there are funny bathing problems, and there's also temporal planning that I will talk to you about. You know, you last, you heard of some temporal planning is the context of SMDP, but it turns out that a true temporal planning is a lot more interesting in the kind of things that people talk about. Um, actions with duration, they have effects, they have continuous change over the duration of this effect. 
and you're trying to make a plan beforehand. And, and, and I think it's a, there's, there's work going on there, uh, even now, but the, the point is that actually just understanding that that point exists in the spectrum of planning task is going to be very really useful for you because you know how, the, uh, you know, how that would correspond to, for example, the, uh, you know, the robot trying to learn to walk, which you don't necessarily call that as planning. In fact, I think one of you have mentioned, I think, uh, um, Dennis has mentioned in his review that I don't even think that walking is uh, requires planning. It's kind of true. I mean, if in fact we have consciously planned to walk, we'll fall on our face. Um, but we do actually, that the word planning is inextricably connected to control. And, you know, in, in a sense, look back a plan. In fact, that's one other thing that I probably should do at some point of time. Um, planning is related to control. And a plan is a controller. Okay. And it comes from control theory. Now, the interesting thing is the control theory people uh, basically look at continuous dynamics, short horizon. The planning people, is anybody actually going to take notes today? Okay. I mean, the, the, those of you who are extremely smart that you have taken any notes, I also don't know who you are. So when time comes to give grades, since most of it is subjective, I'll just pass a fine and say, do I know this person's case? And you know, that would be very nice. But in general, by the way, honestly, it's a graduate level course. You know, you get what you put into it. Okay, and it's very strange that the same people who have taken notes again raise their hands, but the rest of you are all probably there for the right. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work too well. I mean, I don't really care about your grades, but I think you will not get the, the bigger failure would be that you won't get much of it. Okay. Um, so the so the basically. In the case of planning, you typically tend to look at long horizon. And then you also look at quasi uh, discrete. Okay, I mean, I understand continuous is a general case of discrete, but on the other hand, you can't not think about continuous dynamics in short term controller kinds of scenarios. So, for example, you know, the the pattern state of RL, pattern state of RL, no, actually, no, the, the, not pattern state, the fruit fly of RL is inverted spindular top. Right? That is basically you have a pendulum. I don't know who in their right mind would want to do this, but on the other hand, actually, you, I mean, this is not a planning problem per se, the way you think about it, but there is a pendulum that is inverted that is connected to a car, and this car can move like this. And so the whole idea is to move it in such a way that the pendulum will remain um, vertical uh, within some percentage. That's what you're doing when you are bicycling. <laughs> it's a different kind of two wheel pendulum problem, right? Um, you would say that those are control problems, typically. And in fact, RL essentially connects to that problem as on one side, basically, you know, inverted pendulum problem comes from control theory. And so actually, if those of you, you know, there is a there is another course on reinforcement learning that starts here by Dimitri Balsekas. Um, he will be teaching it again in, in, uh, in uh, spring. And he comes from control theory. And he actually looks at the whole thing. Uh, essentially, he does a deterministic inside the continuous dynamics, not necessarily short horizon, but continuous dynamics. Okay, and focus. Okay. Um, and then you have uh, the, on the other side, the fruit fly of planning, the ICAP sort of planning community is block sword. And when people talk about planning, they mean both, plus more. And it's kind of useful for you to understand which ones they are actually, which, which techniques work with. There are things that actually cross over, but the you know, specifics of the techniques do matter. They do care about the, the properties of the problem. 
So that is something that you want to kind of understand. Anyway, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. And as I said, um, uh, uh, you know, ask me questions about the three papers that I will be mentioning in this bigger spectrum. But you, know, you can bring up the questions. Um, and, and also, I have experts, quote unquote. Uh, two students have you know, had like more of an expert. I mean, Siddhant has read the Danijar paper. He actually presented it many, many weeks back, many months back in our group. And, uh, and Lynn is going to try and answer any questions that I can't ask about the computers. Okay. And this is not surprising. Not if, you know, if, if one of the other things is, you know, many people, um, you know, in, in their reviews pointed out, I think, I think one of you pointed out that it's like too short a time to understand three papers. That's true. But on the other hand, this is how the life generally is. Okay. If you do breakfast search and understand every paper, then you are dead way before anything else done. Um, and so you essentially have to learn the art of reading quickly at an abstract level, not at the level of GPT-3, but you know, more than that. And then be able to figure out which direction you have to go deeper into. That's basically the, the point. I actually picked only three papers, but each of these papers have a whole bunch of papers around those areas. And if you're actually interested in working on any of them, I'll mention some of them, but if you're interested in working on any of those directions, you'll wind up reading a lot more papers. And then reading a paper to actually try to reconstruct uh, what they did is much more, much different from reading a paper to say, I will say a couple of lines uh, and get love off my head. You know, um, so that basically is that's the way it is going to be. Um, so anyway, what are we learning? The, we are learning the models, quote unquote. The question, of course, is what models? The domain model is a model. The goals and constraints are also models. That is the user's what? Okay. The domain model is basically environment dynamics, and the user goals and constraints are the human in the loop. Up until the point where we think that our AI systems have their own intrinsic goals and they don't actually care about us, you know, which is what the whole AI safety people's worry is. Um, if unless you get to that point, most of the goals, the top level goals that AI systems will be working on, and the preferences that they are trying to optimize for are those of the humans, not of their own. Okay, and so that would be you could learn this and you could learn that. In terms of um, you know reinforcement learning terminology, uh, it's uh, this is T the transition model. And this is R the reward model. But then again, one of the things that you have to understand is the transition and reward model are really the assembly language level understanding in the sense that in fact the simplest way to understand a transition model in that is in the tabular form, and the simplest way to understand the reward model in the tabular form. Right, and so transition model, you basically think in terms of P, SI given SJ and action A. That means in SJ, uh, uh, you know, if you do action A, what the probability that you get into SI, the state SI. Okay, that's the simplest way to think of transition model. And the simplest way to think of reward model is just R of S. And you can even say that the R of S is a actual distribution. That means the reward is uncertain, and then it sort of follows some distribution. That's actually possible. It doesn't change too much uh, of the, the actual background of the other problem. But um, those are the two things: the reward and the, and, and 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 then this one. If these probabilities are ones and zeros, then you have deterministic model. Okay, so everything comes from there. You know, it's like the trading machine uh, level of understanding of planning. Um, except the question is, you're trying to learn these. And, you know, one of the other things you have to understand is how much of the quote unquote learning is at the tabular level. And in, in the intro to AI, I make this point that pretty much the only learning that anybody talks about at the tabular level representation, that means extensional black box states representation, is reinforcement learning. Okay, because any other kind of learning, the supervised learning, etc., that you talk about, they're always at the picture level. They're not at the black box state. Yet. If you're at the black box state, you don't know what to generalize. Unless the state has features, how do you generalize S1500? 
there's no way. But in the enforcement, what you're trying right to figure out is you're trying right to figure out how good is S5900 given the reward matrix. And that is a kind of learning. It's actually search, but it's a kind of learning, you know, if you're actually trying to do it in real you know. Okay. Um, so the T is the learning dynamics, R is the learning preferences. These are closely connected, but they have their own distinctions. That's actually worthwhile understanding. You know, hopefully you'll actually read a couple of preferences papers too later on. Um, so that, uh, and then you have done. Uh, so the question, of course, is the three papers that you've read are learning what? Do people see that? They're all learning dynamics. At least that much it should be clear. If not, then you're actually lost in the you know in the bushes and you're missing the forest. <laughs> okay, none of the guys that you have looked at are learning preferences. They're just learning dynamics. Okay, notice, however, that one interesting thing is dynamics, references, this, um, this, this the, the border is porous. Okay, so the idea is that some of the times basically in the preferences, some preferences can be made part of the dynamics. If it's like a hard preference, you may as well have just put it in part of the dynamics. Okay, but you know, given any specific scenario, you know, what is the dynamics and what the humans can add on top of it. That would be the purpose. So you learned the three papers that you learned you're doing are all dynamics. So they're all learning T. They're all basically learning T, S I, P N, S J, and K. That's it. That's how they're learning. And you just not actually figuring out how they do that itself is half of the fun. Okay. Um, so the methods for learning dynamics, um, they change based on the type of the domains. In particular, one of the biggest issues winds up being, you know, explicit versus tacit knowledge domains, and also sharp versus sharp horizon, continuous control. Typically, it tend to be tacit. The reason Dennis doesn't think he's planning how to walk is because it's happening subconsciously. And when he's about to fall, he tightens it. It becomes conscious. He becomes conscious of the fact that he's about to fall or that somebody actually came in. Okay. Um, so you don't actually make a conscious plan. You have learned a controller. You learned a controller how to, how to walk. And that control is basically if you really control that she's taking. And once in a while, it gets into trouble, and then you are realizing that, oh, I did learn it. Right? Um, and then, so the, the, the tacit knowledge is tacit horizon continuous control, and the explicit knowledge typically tends to be long horizon and discrete dynamics. It's approximately, it's not that way, and there's no real reason why it should be that way. But you know, the interesting problems are all in one class would be the one type. The control theory people almost so there is there is discrete event. And how many of you have electrical engineering background? Okay, have you taken control theory courses? An actual control, real control theory courses. So all control theory courses, they don't play around with discrete. They just play with continuous dynamics. They only play with continuous dynamics. That they start from there, and discrete dynamics for them is a special case. There are a few people in the control theory world that do discrete dynamics. Like, for example, Peter Ramach um, used to be, you know, he and other people like that would do discrete event control systems, discrete um, tactics. Okay, and they are actually closer to the kind of planning that we talked about in ICAP style planning, you know, whatever the, the strip style planning, I shouldn't call it ICAP style planning, strip style planning. Okay, um, so the, in, in control theory, you mostly you get the continuous from the uh, get go. Um, and, and then in the strips planning, you tended to look, you start by looking at the discrete events and then start adding control continuous as an after. 
it's always that way. In many cases, you know, in a, if a problem might have, you know, property one as well as property two, some people will just assume property two will work out later and then work with the property one. Other people will say, I work on property one later, I work on property two. So if you think of something like what would be called symbolic AI versus neural networks, uh, other deep learning stuff, it, you know, one set of people that will just work on the top down symbolic parts, and one of these days will figure out how to make sure that the sensory knowledge can be connected. Okay, that has been called the pixel to predicate problem. And then all of us will talk, yeah, hey, we should talk about it. Let's just, you know, let's just do it one of these days. And then we'll move on with uh, lots of interesting stuff at the symbolic level. Okay, and then the other side is essentially saying, yeah, yeah, long horizon, yeah, 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 one of these things which talk about long horizon. But just for now, let's just figure out how robots can try to learn to walk or uh, try to learn to, you know, basically walk while, you know, Follow from the base a couple of times and then I mean, from way from that's why actually there's this slide that I had shown earlier, which I'll show again. There are like two different things. So, bridging planning and reinforcement learning tends to be this question of how do you bridge this continuous time based short horizon tasks with discrete time based long horizon tasks? And both are required. And some subset ignore one and some subset ignore one. You can go one from each direction, but you know, that's what quite comes from. Okay, so which of the which which is which for the three papers? Explicit versus that's none of the means. Yeah. So okay, by the way, one other thing is when you talk, even though some of your faces I know, please say your name uh, because I've been chided, correctly so, because even people who have I who I know the 471 people can fall, I'm confusing them. I call the Asha Lakam Sani Prachu Shavi and vice versa. And then I called the um, Nicholas. <laughs> you know. So and the rest of you like a plug. So if if you bug me, you don't have to worry at all because I will be able to <laughs> describe you to police. You know, I'm like extremely bad at face recognition, which is exactly why you need to do some extra work to make sure that I connect the faces uh, to names. But yes. I'm Tommy. Tommy. Okay. Okay. So the first paper about learning the action model versus from action sequences and learning the preconditions and effects, that's explicit knowledge because that's encoded in like the strips. It has like the explicit, you can see every part. Oh, of the okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, the second paper, which was the uh, the one with the inverted pendulum. That's your paper. Yeah. So okay. that paper uh, was tacit knowledge. Um, it comes from like the pixel array display. Yeah. There's no like state dynamics encoded in okay. that. And then the last paper is learning the explicit um, representation. So it was taking the like general, like you're able to see these sensory inputs and creating an explicit knowledge extraction from that. So basically, yes. So basically the first one assumes that one of these days will be the pixel to predicate, but right now we just predicate as the input and learn from it. And the last one assumes one of these days we will do, you know, long horizon, but you know, not last one, the middle one, you know, the, the danger thing. One of these days, he actually doesn't say it necessarily, but if you kind of put words into that set of people, there's one of these days we will learn, um, you know, um, long horizon. Uh, but for now, we will just sort of figure out how to get um, faster planning. And, and one of the very interesting questions there becomes, that the model based versus model free planning, which is better, becomes extremely hard to figure out in the short horizon controller. You understand what I'm saying? So, in fact, in, in real life, you almost never say that, I mean, not a, in long horizon planning tasks, you almost never say that I can just go there and read it. You know what I'm saying? How about a travel plan which involves no plan at all? I just go somewhere and try to go from there to some other place, try to go from there to some other place, and then hope that some something happens. Okay, hitchhiking comes close, but even hitchhikers actually plan. They, for example, know when to, where to stand asking for rights to begin. Do you see what I'm saying? So there is no model free policies that people. It's extremely hard to come up with universal model free policies for long horizon tasks. Okay, so it becomes easy to say a planning report. Right? On the other hand, at the controller level, 
it's not as it's not clear whether all you needed was controller. So one of the interesting things, uh, one of the interesting things that uh, you may not have noticed is planning field, control theory field, plan controller. What is planning? A synthesis of plans. That is sort of synthesis of controllers. And controller is essentially a policy, right? In general, in the classical control theory, people almost don't even talk about how you, you know, how you put together the controller. They will essentially say, here are the kind of controllers you can have, the bag bag controller, the PID controller, and here is the kind of properties they will have. Okay, and so you almost are instantiating a particular type of policy. Um, a controller is a policy, particular type of policy um, to your problem. So the, the control theory folks don't talk about synthesis of controllers much in, in the beginning. They might at some point time, but in the beginning, normal control theory. So when you are saying plan synthesis, generating plans before executing them, then you are sort of assuming different kinds of problems, like the long horizon problems, um, you know. And, and, and so it becomes harder for the control, you know, in, in the short horizon uh, and continuous dynamics to even say that model base versus model C, which is better. And in fact, one of the underlying background themes that we may or may not have caught on to in the Danger paper is he is essentially riding at the deep mind folks um, who try to solve these problems essentially as model free RLs with DQ and etc. And he's saying, compared to them, I'm doing slightly better by actually learning the model. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so, that, so once you have the model, connect, converting the model into the policy that is needed for the particular state that you are looking at, that would be what essentially he winds up doing in the model based case. In the model free case, we just learn the policy, like upfront. There is no model separate. DQN would have just learned the policy. Now, of course, the problem is if you do it perfectly, then essentially they would be equivalent. But since there's always the issue of, you know, how much of the space you have seen, how well is your, either the model or policy generalizing across the states that you haven't seen, given those considerations, they wind up having different trade-offs, model three versus model three. And these are not the kind of trade-offs that you think of when you think of, I need to plan to go to San Francisco or to Europe or to pass my exam. I can't just read it. You see what I'm saying? Because to some extent, so that's something that you want to keep in mind. Okay. Um, so, and then so the damage is the second type. And the third one essentially kind of says that many problems have both short horizon continuous dynamics and the long horizon discrete dynamics at the same time. And you do planning in both levels. Right, and the question then is, if you are starting from scratch, can you kind of abstract the sharp horizon continuous dynamics into some symbolic long horizon discrete dynamics? That's what that part is. Okay. Um, so, now if you are going to learn, then how are the different ways you can learn? Actually, there's one other thing that I forgot to mention here. Um, I should probably write that too. Um, okay. um, the first idea, zeroth idea, if you are learning uh, models, if you're learning style models, okay, knowledge engineering. So in domains like, uh, you know, like, like mission planning in NASA, uh, you know, which time means military or some any factory domain at a higher in the long horizon case, there would be people 
who would know what are the kinds of operations you can take at least and what are the kinds of features you should be interested in and which features seem to be preconditions for which operations and which features seem to be effects for each operations. They may not know the exact probability distribution, but they know enough, they can tell you enough about what the action structure is. So one idea would be that you interview them, essentially. There would be an analogy engineering effort. This was the old expert systems method. Um, it, the point is that there are domains that actually that makes a lot more sense than essentially saying in the, than, than the other two approaches that we will do. Okay, and so there's fact in the ITAPS community, in the strips planning community, there are actually people, I forgot to write this, uh, who have spent time in making um, IDEs, um, which I think actually the one, there's one by Christian Musi, right? That's the one, the Musi basically, okay. I think you guys played with it too, where you can, when you wrote the PDM domains for the first project, essentially it allowed you to kind of, Describe the actions, taken in effects, and then try to see, try to debug to some extent. You see what I'm saying? It's like program debugging. You write the program and you debug your program. And a symbolic debugger will help you write the program faster. And there are approaches, basically, including that thing that you use for, for project one, I believe, which sort of make it easier for you to write down the domain model that you may have in mind. You, the expert, has in mind. So we should not take that out of the equation. That is actually probably the most reasonable thing to do for certain kinds of things. This is exactly what happens, for example, in NASA mission planning. I can tell you that. I mean, we, people, they send rover and they send uh, uh, all these things uh, to NASA, right? So they actually have models of these actions. In fact, they have models of the temporal actions with pretty strong detail. That experts have put in there. I understand that that's sort of the pendulum has swung to a point that that's not seen as a kosher thing to do. And you want to learn somehow from traces, but exactly how many traces of spacecraft going to Mars are there from which you can figure out how to do Mars planning? You understand what I'm saying? Then you can say, no, I'll just give you a simulator. Then the question becomes extremely clear. Who the heck is giving you the simulator? And are they much happier just giving you the model than the simulator? You understand what I'm saying? So it's worthwhile keeping that in mind. So this is the zeroth idea. And you know, that's your project zero, actually. Your projects. Um, And if that's not the case, then you are trying to do the other things, which is essentially like, you know, um, learn. So basically, you're learning the model from by like yourself. So one idea would be uh, learning from the traces of old plants, which is what ARM system is. Learning from the traces of old plants. Now, the first question, we'll talk about that first. The first question is, where do you get these traces of old plants? In fact, it's reasonable ask exactly who really are the situations where the experts don't want to give you the model they have in their mind, but they'll give you a thousand traces or a million traces of them working on the plants. And so that you can reconstruct the model they have in mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it can make computational sense if in fact, you just happen to be unobtrusively watching people do Behavior. And the behavior corresponds to some property, say the plan or unplanned behavior. Right? Okay. Um, so here is actually an interesting question. So, so let me get to that in a minute. So, so you would, if you assume, observe some humans achieving their goals, that's over sort of, um, um, you know, in, in either in some uh, simulated environment, or you actually just have to these places of them achieving goals are actually doing actions. You can use those to figure out what the model, the action model is. And that's basically what ARMS does, but in fact, it's like one level deeper, but we'll get to that. Okay. Um, the other possibility is you found descriptions of these kinds of plants on the web. 
Actually, interestingly enough, every recipe is a plan. How to make some particular dish, that's a plan. Right? And when you ever ask for a recipe, you ask for a plan. And of course, they normally have even more interesting structures, such as the loops in the plan and so on. But it's a plan ultimately. So if you have a recipe, um, many people have put these recipes, speaking how, you know, we'll have recipes for doing lots and lots of things. You see what I'm saying? And so the question would be, can you then go from there to the action model? And, and of course, to be able to do that, essentially, these recipes are typically written in the way that humans can understand the recipes that we have in a in natural language. So you've got to do some natural language extraction to go from there to go from there to um, something like a uh, formatted you know, apparatus, apparatus sequence class. And in fact, um, Alberto in some work basically showed, I mean, there has been a lot of work in planning community which tried to look at recipes on the um, available on the web and then converting them into formal information. Because that's like, that's a version of information extraction task. Especially plan extraction. And you could do plan extraction. People did plan extraction with a variety of approaches before, specialized approaches, uh, including neo-written papers as well. Um, you know, given some you know, text, uh, how do you convert it into like a plan that corresponds to that text, textual description of the recipe? Um, one good thing is if you have something like GPT 3, which among everything else, it's like a great translator. You know, large, large language models. Are able to translate from one language to another language. They can translate from English to Spanish, Spanish to something else. They can also translate from natural language to strict representation. If you give them a couple of examples, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, um, uh, uh, I'll what he did was he gave a couple of prompts. Here is the text, here is the plan, here is the text, here is the plan. So you would read, if you read the text, you would agree that the plan extracted is the correct. And corresponding to the text. And then you give another text, piece of text, and it is converted. And then, you know, it's not foolproof, it's not 100% correct, but on the other hand, it's been shown that it's actually pretty competitive with specialized approaches that just are made to convert text into that. So, one idea when you're thinking about where are the behaviors coming from, uh, one idea would be that, yeah, you could convert. This, if it's, in, if it's in the natural language, right, if it's written somewhere, GPT can come up. But then we are actually going beyond that. Essentially, at some point of time, we could say that videos can be converted into formal representation. That's a pretty far off See, We already can convert pictures into scene graphs. If I can convert pictures into scene graphs, then I can convert videos into some object oriented description of what happened in the video. Especially if I show you a couple of videos of the blocks world stacking behavior, I would bet that it would be very easy to convert it into words. Okay, it's not available yet, but it would be much easier to convert it into words than if you show a funny walking robot. A video, and you don't have the heck to convert it because we don't even have the vocabulary to convert that behavior into language. Whereas the block world, block world stacking, you know, does actually have it's an explicit knowledge task. So, in particular, if I show you explicit knowledge tasks, behavior from explicit knowledge tasks, uh, videos from explicit knowledge tasks can. Process to get plans. You certainly didn't think about it. I mean, those of you who complained about, for example, Arm said, yeah, obviously, Hans is just used to be assuming that. Actually, it wasn't Hans. Uh, Chang Yang um, was the first paper that I made to read, but there's many other versions of that was done by this guy, Hansi, um, who, who 
visited us multiple times. Um, so you're just assuming that he just made up this so in some, in some sense, actually, you could say that the way that work is set up is you start with a model, a strips model, and a planner, generate a whole bunch of plans using the planner, and then see if you can invert and get back to the old model. But that's the way normally many of these things are done. And if it's working there, then you hope that when you don't know the generating model, you will try to. That's exactly how all generating models work. It's right. Um, if it's working there, then you hope that even when I don't know where the plans came from, I would be able to, my inversion would be the one I probably that's the right. Was there a, a yes? And this, this is making me blur the lines between tacit and explicit knowledge a lot, and I'm getting extremely confused. <laughs> <laughs> would this be tacit knowledge or would this be explicit knowledge then? What? Would these, uh, the, the thing that it processes, that, that act, does that mean that it's... See, look, at the sensory level, at the sensory level, right, you do have to actually make sense of the images and the videos. How you made sense of images and videos and are even the language in the beginning, that's tacit. We are not conscious of it. After you made the translation, that's not the end of AI. Even though GPT 3 people would make you think that that's the end of AI. That's still not the end of AI. Even after seeing a Bloxworld video, you know, Bloxworld kind of video, you say, oh, it looks like this is what they do. And so you have a trace now. And then one more trace and one more trace. At that point, you don't necessarily yet have the model. So going from those traces to the model, that's basically the, the fact that you converted those traces easily into extracted plans already tells you that after the object recognition, after the task recognition and object recognition are done, it's essentially a symbolic task at that point. And then you go from there to the bottom. Okay, so so anything, any reasonable thing will have both the tacit and explicit parts. The real question is if so, consider the distinction between video of lots of plans versus the videos that Daniel Hoffman is looking at, which is the videos of robots what? There is no simple description of how Prenta work like this. Can you write it in English how I work? The interesting thing that we are such symbolic beings that you will still write something, rub it some kind of a half pirouette, especially if you're a technical <laughs> ballet guy, you know, half pirouette and some lame, you know, kind of a turn, and that's what it is. But that's not a complete description at all. Whereas if I put one block and up on the block, there are lots of other things that are happening, but you just say the main thing that's happening is this block going on top of this block. So that's what you say, you know. Now it depends on what you're trying to automate. If you're trying to automate, if I'm trying to put the block one on block to this way, that was <laughs> just put on it. The question then is, what are you trying to learn from this? What are you trying to optimize? If you're just trying to learn, you know, what makes blocks be stacked in the right configurations, that part is basically explicit knowledge and symbol. You're learning how people can put funny, you know, motions to put the block in top of the That is classic. And going from you know, signals, basically the, the whole, there's this whole thing called pixels to predicates. So going from symbols, going from sensory information to extracted plan, is that part is anyway kind of going to be test. Because we do it and we don't know how we do it. And if we do, then computer vision have been solved first, like the way kids solve computer vision. They solve computer vision first, and then they start solving block stacking. We solved block stacking way before. We solved playing chess way before. And then only now we are solving how to, you know, recognize faces. People like me still can't, but other people can. Okay. It's a very good question. And I think you should think about this. And, you know, uh, but 
that the essential part ultimately would be now that I gave you these extracted plants, how do you get them on? And the real computational question you want to ask yourself is, is there an advantage in doing so? Or should I just look at the video and not convert it to any symbolic representation effectively? And then try to do natural plan just by watching, in the sense that you cannot stop doing it. You, the humans, when they see block stacked videos, they're thinking, oh, you're putting block one on block. You're putting the red block on the video. That's how you think. I can't stop you from doing that. Because that's how you evolve. We see objects, we see relations, whether you like it or not. Okay, but if you are AI systems, AI systems don't have to see objects. They don't have to see relations at all. They have to just see pixels on top of pixels. Actually, pixels changing. There's no pixels on top of pixels. <laughs> pixels changing. That's what Daniel Raffner is doing. He's not, he doesn't actually think that there is an object anywhere in the video. You see what I'm saying? So the question is, how far get, do you really believe that that can get you to even understanding blocks work? Forget about NASA mission. Doesn't that depend on whether you trust the robust representation of what you have? Like no, you no, it's actually you also a computational issue as to whether, in fact, it is possibly efficient. Then one of the things abstraction does is it removes humanness among the relevant details. Right, so if I show you a video, a glass hole stack video, you know, there are literally millions of block stacking videos, all of which would be extracted to you put the red box on top of the green box. That's it. Do you agree? I can make, I mean, you can do this. I mean, all of you can upload videos on the you know, YouTube, right? So, especially if you're less than 50 seconds. So, each of you upload. A red block on top of a green block. If you take those videos, what is the chance that they would be identical in any meaningful sense at the same time at the pixel level? Zero. And yet they're all actually equivalent because they are showing the exact same what's all behavior. Only if you think at that level. If on the other hand you start caring about how the hand is moving and putting A on top of B, what else is in the you know in the video in the background where you're putting A on top of B, all those things. Plus, is are you using pixel with uh, pixel seven with the following video capabilities or slide four with the following other video capabilities? All of this change the actual video. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is we live with this. We see two very, I mean, in fact, what do you guys do? You pick a picture, you don't like the picture, you put lots of filters, and you convince yourself that the one that looks much nicer, like a Hollywood star of my face, is the same as me before when I was looking like a lame guy, you know, of all these filters, right? I mean, you are essentially saying in abstract, it's the same. I mean, my internal beauty is restricted by this filter. That's what you're doing. Right, but they are actually not the same pictures at all, unless you do some kind of an object recognition. I don't know if this makes sense. I mean, these are tricky things to kind of you know uh, uh, fold into your thinking. Okay, uh, but it's a good question, and, and I hope somebody likes it all up. Okay, um, yeah. So these are the things. Um, so then basically if you have past recipes or the, even the videos, and then when you're talking about videos, blackboard videos versus robot walking videos. They're very different. Blackboard videos will have a symbolic extraction. Robot walking videos won't. That's to me, that's it for sex. Okay. Um, anyway, um, one last thing is, here's, if you are learning dynamics, does the behavior that you see, the traces of the behavior that you see, do they have to be optimal or not? No. 
You guys see that, right? What? You want them to be diverse. Maybe. You want them as, to as diverse as possible. Diverse is different. I'm talking about the each of the places should they be active. I'm thinking no because in my mind it's like um, so long as it achieves the specified goal. No, but actually, actually, the interesting thing is you don't know what the heck is the goal. Have you seen kids? What the heck are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Random blocks on top of blocks, once in a while putting them in their mouth, and what the heck is going on? Nothing looks optimal. It doesn't seem to be any good. It's not like I told you don't do the following here, top of me, top of CR, you don't do the assessment and other. They're still showing random blocks. It's because they're just doing random actions and observing after the action how the world is. And we, the coding periods, make sure that after any random action, the world for them won't end by, for example, removing unloaded guns <laughs> from the home. Unless you have something against your kid. Okay. <laughs> so, because you put unloaded gun in the home, you, every once in a while you read these people. I mean, I'm a loaded gun in the home. Like every once in a while, it's like so stupid that the civilization got us to a point where we can't realize this, that you put a loaded gun and you think that oh, I'm sure kid will not. That's why every once in a while you see that kid basically did. Oh no, and I see actually in some ways it was like a I have like a Schadenfreude when the guy who gets injured is the guy who left the gun and you know no way. And because it's like just it's like you know you don't understand what's going on in life. But anyway, if you stabilize the environment such that in a sense you're making the environment almost as close to a simulator as possible. That in the sense it becomes a good, it is not that simulated, it becomes a good. Don't put your kids in unergodic living rooms. Okay, and then this is that there is no kid when you come back. Right? Um, so if you do put them in the car carry thing, they just do random stuff. And they learn how the world works from those random Which is exactly what will happen if you're learning from traces too. They don't have to be. Goal directed optimal traces. As long as you've done actions in different different you know, scenarios, you have information enough to figure out what does that action do. Once you figure out what the action does, you put it in a model. Then when you actually have the goal, you put the model to get, get the goal. That's the point. Yes. Intuitively, wouldn't it be kind of useful to have examples of things that go wrong so that you know not to do them like you see a kid. I mean, yeah, newspapers are full of those, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. But I mean, what, what do you mean? Um, so, like, you talked about how should all the plant traces be optimal plant or like following an optimal like policy? No, they shouldn't. But like, it's actually kind of helpful to have some that are following like bad plants or bad policies because then you're able to see, okay, maybe I shouldn't. That's a that's a very this. interesting point. Actually, that's actually a very interesting point. And this is exactly the kind of place that I wish. Um, yeah, I wish I could just make it. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting point, actually. And that is related to whether the traces that you have seen are diverse enough. Really. Okay. How, it's not that you want it to be optimal. You do want to know, for completeness sake, what does happen if you want to point, point the gun to yourself. And if there's nobody else telling you anything, you have to learn that. Presumably for that, you should have seen some actual trace that happened. That happened. But that captures, that, that is captured by just the diversity and the notion of exploration in the RL sense. And exploration is exactly how people get into trouble. I mean, we, we, we talk about this beauty of how when you explore, then you are more optimal. But then maybe some people who tried to explore actually got killed. And other people then wrote down, okay, so those parts we should And then they got more up. Which is why people love simulators. Because simulators, they don't actually kill you. They just say, killed in big red letters. And then you start all over again. Then you start a problem. But then who wrote the simulator so that the simulator is complete? Like when you first came to this world, 
there was nobody who already put a simulator there, unless like people came. I, that's why I had this thing that you know, how many of you have seen 2001 Space Odyssey? Right? I mean, in the beginning of the Space Odyssey, that movie actually is an this idea that there is a, there is a, uh, like this big, you know, blocks that are standing there, like, you know, and then these primates look at them and they get some signals about these alien intelligence. Right? And so that may have been, if, if that's the way simulators came into this world and we, you know, learned how to use the simulator, that's one thing, but that's not the way, uh, that's a science fiction book. Right. So, in general, if the, if simulators can allow for learning diverse behaviors, but if you do it in the real world, you do diverse behaviors, you run the risk. If in fact it is non ergodic, then you keep on doing random things, one day you'll die. Okay. So, yeah, so the diverse races are important, optimality is not important. Huh. Yes. Uh, so I uh, kind of related to that though. Uh, I guess in almost an adversarial sense, could you the like stream of like experiences you have or like the experiences you trace from, could they like maybe it, could it be the case that maybe they have some like faulty dynamic built into them? For example, like we have like superstitions in our world, right? And maybe like all of the examples we demonstrate are people who like kind of live their yeah, life. Yeah, that's life. basically, that's just the sample bias. Anything that you learn depends on the sample bias. It can be affected by sample bias. There's like no question whatsoever. Okay. Um, unless the expert gives the model, in which case you only have the expert to blame. They just did not know that there was a particular condition. Or they didn't even know that there was another action available. But if I give you some number of traces, and in all the traces, an action is only applied in a certain kind of a state and not other kind of a state, and if you apply in the other kind of a state, completely different kind of outcomes happen. You would never learn it because the trace didn't tell you. Because notice what is happening here. If you are learning dynamics this way, this is just, you are talking about the inside of an RLA How the model, is learned in the RL agent. But RL agent as a whole has to be with explanation exploitation. This doesn't go away. It doesn't go away for anybody. It doesn't go away for Nadia Rahman. It doesn't go away for the arms guy. It doesn't go away for anyone. In general, you just assume that, you know, assuming that the, you know, the action traces that are available are. Good representation and what is the difference? Yes. So the, the kind of uh, mod, the kind of uh, environment dynamics they would learn would be domain specific, correct? In all of these. Yeah, of course. I mean, in the sense that you are basically. I mean, it's the question of how much you generalize from there is a different issue. The first thing is you are learning for that task that you have. See. Yeah, that's so, what I mean, learning the domain model is, is domain specific. You know, if I'm showing the box world traces, you should learn box world domain. And then you can use the box world domain with your domain independent strips planner or the partial order planner or whatever planner working on this domain model to produce your red plans. But that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Okay. So learning from the whole plant traces, where do you get them? As I said, I already said this, assume you observe some humans. Actually, I, you know, I don't know what happened. And I was writing this and I was going to add this zeroth idea here and I forgot. And, and that's why I shifted this to this other slide and I did not add the zeroth idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, why the heck am I saying the same thing? Um, so this we already talked about. Now, how complete are the traces? So whether or not you can easily read the word from the traces, um, how complete are the individual traces? What's the 
complete is the coverage of the cases. The coverage of the cases is what we were talking about just before we did. And I give you a bunch of places. All the places seem to be using actions in a certain scenario. In fact, I just gave you 10,000 copies of the same exact case. Right? That would basically obviously give you an incomplete domain. But a different question is for every trace, how complete is that trace? And that is something that you may not have thought about, and that actually winds up changing the actual algorithms that you use for that. Okay, the simplest scenario is you observe both actions and states, and the observation is complete. Okay, and you assume that the observation is at the symbolic terms. So the observation uh, is the symbolic terms. Okay, observe actions and states completely, and, and it's in the symbolic terms. Um, Fix in symbolic terms, then essentially I would argue it's a trivial problem. Why? Because if I know the state and the action and the next state, and I know that this action is a deterministic strips action, especially. In fact, the only thing you need, you know for sure what its effects are. Almost trivial, not fully trivial. It, you know for sure what its effects are because effects are the ones that change from trace to trace, from, from one state to other state. The fluids whose values change from one state to other state. Right? Because you assume that the fluids don't change unless the action changes. What is not clear is if every fluid in the previous state is a precondition for this action or not. Right? So you might start saying this is the full set of things. This is the specific, it's an overly specialized set of things. That means if you actually see all of this holding in the state, you can do this action. And then a little later, you do the same action in a different state. Its effects won't change. If it's a deterministic action, its effects that you compute by just doing the algebraic difference between the fluids that change, you start have changed. But you have two different states from which the action is applicable. That means its preconditions could have only been the things that are common between the two states. You see what I'm saying? So, in fact, in 1994, uh, Yolanda Hill, um, her thesis basically was doing this. Um, and she actually was the triple A president um, for, you know, recently. Uh, you know, but when she was a student, you know, what her thesis was learning um, action models for places. It's almost trivial because finding the effects themselves is very trivial. But finding the preconditions essentially requires looking at all the states in which this action is and then start of realizing that the only things are that if you assume conjecture preconditions, then realizing that the intersection of those states is a simple thing. Okay, you can start from there and then you can say, well, what if I observe only the actions and no information whatsoever about the states? Okay, and in that case, you have to figure out what the preconditions affects that must be ascribed to the actions so that the sequence makes sense. In fact, in this particular kind of scenario, if you don't know the goal, it becomes hard to learn. You understand what I'm saying? If for the previous case, you don't even need to know what the goal is. Okay. Um, if you know, if in the second case, you kind of need to sort of know what the goals are, so that because then you know that you're going towards them. And so essentially, you will say, well, these actions must all be supporting those goals and all their preconditions have to be supported. So, in essence, you are hypothesizing the effects and the preconditions for these actions 
and putting these hypothetical constraints, saying if you know I need this goal, then one of the actions previous to the goal state must have given it. So like a disjunctive constraint. You see what I'm saying? And, and if you say that there are certain preconditions are being hypothesized for the action, then you must say that in every some state before it, or actually, in fact, the, the, the state preceding it must have those preconditions. And the only way things can be true is if they are not either true in the initial state or they kept, they were true in the initial state and they kept it true until they were needed, or somewhere in between. Things came and went. If you're listening to me, what am I doing? I'm just trying to make a hypothetical proof for this sequence of actions, a causal link for this sequence of actions. And we have a bunch of constraints. Right? For every place, I will write this kind of a and then for all the traces together, since all of the traces must have achieved their goals, all those constraints must be true. And the things, the parameters in the learning is the preconditions you are assuming for the actions and the effects you are assuming for the actions. This is actually what ARMS is doing. It's writing a whole bunch of SAT classes and, you know, essentially doing the max SAT because there could be some noise because it doesn't quite know how many effects to assume, how many preconditions to assume. Okay, and then, then basically MaxAt will say, try the assignment that violates the least number of constraints. As again, as normal SAT would say, so try the assignment that is, you know, satisfies all constraints. Weighted MaxAt will say, try the assignment that violates the least amount of cumulative violation of the violation. So now if you go in and see what are all those funny constraints that they're writing, they're essentially writing this hypothetical proof lines for each trace that they're seeing. And they all are added together and you're solving to make sure that I mean, you're, you're basically solving that max set, and that will give you a you know, parameter value, so which action should have which preconditions and which effects. Do you guys see this? Okay. So that is ARMS, and this is actually pretty, as I said, some proof of correctness must go. Um, and then you can go beyond this uh, noisy observations. That means you got a trace. But maybe some of the actions were wrongly observed. Forget about the state. Some of the actions were wrongly observed. Or you can say, I have actually state action, state action traces. Okay, except some actions are wrongly observed and the states are partially observed. That means not all the features of the state are actually visible. There are papers for all these. ARMS is just the beginning of that line. You know, the way you guys do know how to look for papers that came in a particular direction, um, you go to Google Scholar and basically look at who cited ARMS. And then you follow that link. Then you know, and then use your, you know, um, some common sense in terms of reading that, uh, that I could accept that to see whether or not it's one more different version of the um, action uh, model learning. Okay, so missed observing actions, incorrectly observed actions. So in fact, I have like, you know, this is this Hansi is the guy I was talking about. Hansi basically has a whole bunch of these papers. One I, I was involved with was in HKI 2013, where essentially noisy observations of the actions and the probabilistic noise, and then we essentially work, take that into consideration. So you kind of generalize the max app that, uh, um, is used to such that it will be problems. Okay. Um, and then another paper that I was involved in uh, was uh, with Tony Jan. Uh, and I think, in fact, there's a student of his who's actually extending it now. Um, 
This was when he was actually a postdoc with me. Um, basically, if you see an action and you didn't see for a bunch of time, so a whole bunch of actions may have been between, and then you see one more action. So with indefinite gaps, you're observing, occasionally observing what actions are taking place. Then can you generate a model that approximately corresponds to the traces? And that was an Amas paper. I remember it fondly because I went to Istanbul to present it. And it's a lovely place. I was terrified because I presented a paper that you know was kind of painful, but you know. Is nice. But anyway, so that is the point that even with something like symbolic action traces, you can put in all sorts of complications. Is the state information available? Is the partial state information available? Is the trace um, you know, noisy? And actually, nobody really cares about how complete is the coverage of the traces because they have no idea what to do. <laughs> you know, I just assume that it's you know, correct, and then I'll say this is the model. And then you can, one way of dealing with this would be you start with this model, and then every two weeks you look at any more traces you have seen, including the traces you have done, and then rerun the model, rerun the learning. And if you see this, this is just RL being run on the, with you in the loop. Model based model, where the model in the model based model, the model keeps changing. You guys understand that? I mean, you know, those of you, I mean, again, I'm assuming that you know R. Again, I made mean, people be the introductory AI lectures, etc. But you should know R. Right? So, in the tabular representation, model based model, model representation model will be um, changing as experience increases. It hopefully stabilizes. Okay, uh, I think this is also <laughs> okay. So I, I think this also may have been the wrong ordering, but this is fine. Okay, I think I, okay. So instead of waiting for the other people's plans, you can act in the world. Is that different? It is correct. You know, in fact, in the Hamzi case, you assume that somebody gave the traces, but you can say I'll act in the world or in the simulator. That's a reasonable thing to do. And if you do that, and if you have a strip style deterministic simulator with full observability of the states, once again, the problem is trivial. It's basically like the Yolanda Hill problem. You know, the, one, the effects will be known right away. The preconditions, you keep on remembering all the states where you are about what you are able to do this action. And take the intersection of the states. And that would be the big issues. Making sense? Okay. Um, so, but you know, and then the way things become harder when you are doing actions by yourself is that, for example, the actions are stochastic. You are still fully observable, and the simulator still gives symbolic information. So here, notice what I said. Strip style deterministic simulator and full observability, and I also should say getting symbolic state information. And this is not as far fetched as it might sound, honestly. If you have a block sort simulator, it can take state descriptions in features and give you state descriptions in features. That's what you would do. If you wrote a box for simulator, it would be the other Right? And so, and then the question then would be can I learn what the PD, imagine a simulator which is actually using a PDL domain model, and you are interacting with it. You ask, here is my state, I'm doing this action, what would the new state be? It will tell you the new state. Instead of giving you a picture of the state, it will actually give you that symbolic description. And after a bunch of interactions, you're trying to figure out what the PDL model that is underlying the simulator is. That's model learning. Okay. Um, things become more interesting if, for example, the actions are stochastic. Everything else remains the same, the action just becomes stochastic. Things become harder. 
because even effects cannot be right away known. You understand what I'm saying? In the sense that you, I did an action in the previous case, in the Yolanda Hill case, if I do an action once, I know its effects. If it's a full, if fully specified state, if I do the action once, I know its effects. If it's a stochastic action, I need to do it infinitely often to figure out the probabilistic distribution over the effects. The more times I do it, the better my model of the effects. You see what I'm saying? So when we give you stochastic actions, right? Typically, somebody has given you the distribution. Remember that there is deterministic, there is non-deterministic, and there is stochastic. And the knowledge in the case of deterministic, basically you have the maximum amount of knowledge. I know that if I do this action, only these things and nothing else will change. Non-deterministic basically means I know that when I do this action, these things, some of these things will change. I don't know when it will change. Stochastic is in the middle. It gives the actual probabilities, quantifiable measures. This is why, you know, if I say I have a coin, I made up this coin, um, you know, what do you think is the probability that will come? And if you say I of course, it's 50%. That's how you make money. That's how you lose all your money in the casinos. I didn't tell you it's a fair coin. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so if I don't tell you, then you have to assume it's an undeterministic coin, and then you have to see, okay, toss it a couple of times, and then I'll see what the actual probability that it's coming is. In fact, if you remember, this is the 101 of base net learning problems. Based net, you know, uh, learning problems where essentially you know that the coin can come heads or tails, and the question is, you just learning is CPT. And the maximum likelihood estimate for the CPT is just seeing the number of tosses and in which heads came divided by the total number of tosses. That is the problem. Okay. Um, so that becomes hard. In fact, there are papers on dealing with stochastic. Um, if there is also partial observability, not only is the action stochastic, it's still symbolic domains, but some of the states, some of the literal values are not observable. Some of the state variables values are not observable. So I know this is true, I know this is false, I don't know what is it. That's partial observability. And if you have partial observability, things become harder again. Actually, there is work uh, by Chang and Yal, in fact, there's a paper that you can look up called Learning Partially Observable Deterministic Action Models. Notice that partial observability and stochasticity are orthogonal properties. They're not, one, they're not always going together. It doesn't have to, you don't have to make your life the maximum complex at the same time. So even if you have deterministic and you have partial observability, things become hard. Actually, ARMS is hard because it's partial observable. Because the state is partially observable. Like nothing about the state is known. You understood that, right? Except arms, you do this decision with a huge number of traces. Arms makes a batch decision. Arms is a batch model learner. It looks at like whatever thousand traces you have and is trying to at the same time, get the preconditions and effects for all the actions such that all the, all the traces satisfy their goals. Whereas if you're doing one action at a time, like here learning directly from experience, you're kind of doing online decision. And so the ELA thing is actually online. And then you go to simulator gives sensory information, not symbols at all. Then you have two options. You can depend on some GPT-3 or somebody else's DALI++, 
to take that sensory information and convert it into object representation. Remember, if it's box world video, it should be easy to do. If it is dancing video, you clearly won't have a symbolic description. You know what I'm saying? When you say extract, you're extracting it in words that humans will understand, basically. And that's how you know the extractors work. Uh, so you know, if you do that, then even if the simulator gives sensory information, you can then convert it into one of these arms, right? Arms and its generalizations. Okay. And then finally, the world is continuous and short horizon. That means it's not actually, um, it's not, not only that the simulator gives sensory observations, the world, the task itself is continuous. It's not a blocks world task for which I'm giving you sensory information. It is a robot dancing task for which I'm giving you sensory information. In that case, there is no simple way to extract a symbolic version. So it becomes an actual control problem, continuous control problem. And the Hafner paper is actually here. Other three, basically, that's where points have been. Okay. Um, so I should put it here. Versus dancing. Okay. Any questions as to where these things live and how you can convert one to other? So, for example, you could have sensory information coming through of a discrete domain. The funny thing is if the underlying domain is discrete, but you are getting sensory information. Sensory information is continuous, but the underlying reality is discrete. In those cases, extraction can help you get the underlying reality. And then you're back to places with arms. So, if you get this, I have to just be very follow. Okay. Um, yeah. What? When you say underlying, get the underlying reality. So basically, that's the point. If I'm if I am doing blocks world uh, places in front of you, I didn't give it in the symbolic form. You are watching me do. So what you are getting is continuous sensory information, continuous visual information. But then you then basically see that the underlying task is discrete. So you are able to convert into okay, raw put red block on top of blue. But if on the other hand, if I do some funny dance move, then you don't know how to convert it. You can just allow it some funny dance move. That's not particularly informative. You can't repeat the same funny dance move. Whereas in the previous case, you can repeat, you know, putting blocks on top of blocks. Okay. Even if underlying dynamics is discrete. In that case, extraction can work. Now, here's my question. If you want to have an extract, you can look at a bunch of blocks world videos, blocks world traces, apply damages approach. Right, damages approach is the lower one, this one. He basically made it to work for this. You see this, actually, right, in English. There's nothing symbolic about it. There's nothing discrete about it. Okay, but, if you are into videos, you can show the videos of discrete phenomena 
And the video doesn't discreetly stop just because the phenomenon is discrete. You can get that. Right? Okay. And so then if you are actually using the approach that he is using for starting from the video of a blocks world, starting from like a blocks world video snippets and trying to learn blocks world dynamics effectively enough that you can do just simple blocks world planning problems. Can you do? The answer is no. It's extremely hard. These are hard in different spheres. This is hard. I cannot do this. Not just I cannot dance, that's true, but it's also that I don't know how to, you can't directly convert into strips. But this approach won't work for the strips, you know, for actual box wall kinds of domains at all. It will basically be extremely inefficient. If it is actual box wall domain, you are better off doing extraction into a discrete representation and then just use ops, kind of it. If on the other hand, everything is continuous, you might as well do that. Think about the following thing. When you write, basically, actually, the, the funny thing is actually that when you write handwriting of English letters, the writing part is continuous. If you try to process a handwritten document, to get the natural language meaning out of it. But you only look at it as pixels. You are screwed. You are much better off extracting the letters, even if it's noisy, from the handwritten document. The letters are discrete. And go from there. And the fact that even there, even if the letters are discrete, you can actually put them into a vector space, that's a different point. That's a different orthogonal issue. The question is, everything is continuous just because our eyesight is continuous. That doesn't mean that the underlying thing is actually continuous. And if you try to understand language as if it is pictures, how many of you have seen the original Dali where it would essentially generate, yeah, I, you know, if you remind me, I'll send you pictures of that. It will generate pictures with, you know, especially, you know, some of the pictures typically have like placards in the back. There can be like proper stickers in the back. You understand that? <laughs> like, like the way Dali would generate them is as if it's all pixels. So it comes up with extremely funny looking things which are not English letters at all. But they kind of look like English letters. You understand know what I'm saying? They're like gestalt English letters. And they don't actually make any sense whatsoever. Then they quickly figured out that you need the LLM part for the text. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and, and <laughs> so when this was happening, I remember remembering a story when we were undergraduate and we were meeting people, and there was this one kid. I don't know, it's not undergraduate. I should not look too bad if I say I was undergraduate. It's some great school. Mm -hmm. There was this kid who essentially would take longer time to write what is on the board onto their textbook, onto their notebook. Right? And at some point of time, we came up with this theory that you know, this would be a math class and they're actually writing formulas, et cetera. And the way you take what I'm writing on the note tech thing is you look, take a quick look, extract the symbols, write the symbols yourself. Right? So if I, if I want to do Right? You just read this and you write it yourself. If on the other hand, I did this, if 
You better look at it. <laughs> it's a trial. I'm an extremely good trial. <laughs> <laughs> so you look at this and you have to draw this. You understand what I'm saying? Imagine a kid who looks at this the way you are looking at this. They will take a long time to write what is on the board. Since we were mean, we would say this kid doesn't actually even recognize the math symbols. They are drawing what is on the board carefully. <laughs> And if you take a picture of the board and print it, that's exactly what happens. It just does last as scan. But that's not the way you process the information. You actually process the information noticing that underlying information is discrete. And you very quickly recognize what is being written. And then you write it yourself. That's the advantage of bringing extraction to bear even in a seemingly continuous task, because our drawing is continuous. Okay, 15 minutes later. Very large amount of profit. Okay, um, this thing is giving me all the time. It was the it was the previous class. I know, but it was the last time I was classes. <laughs> Can you give me? A um. Okay. So attendance sheet, please write your name. Okay. Um. One other thing before I go forward is for those of you who have done type, who are doing type one project, for those of you who are doing type two project, you should put by now what papers you're reading. I mean, there's really isn't any problem, you know. Uh, and if I have any comments, I'll say them. Uh, but those of you who are doing the type one project, I would basically say, if you haven't already talked to me, and if you still need to talk to me, you still should put like at least a paragraph um, today on what, you know, as a private message with your, you know, group name, whatever the group people, etc. Um, and what a paragraph description of your topic. And then if you want to, if you know enough that you can write a one and a half pages, that's great. I mean, some people have done that already. If you actually are only thinking an abstract and you only have like a paragraph level thing and you want to talk some more with me before you know whether it's feasible or not, then I would want you to put that and then make an appointment within the coming week. Because otherwise it'll be too late. Because if you just wind up having a meeting like just before the semester is ending, then obviously you don't have to do anything. Okay. Um, but you know, for that meeting, you can essentially send me messages and then we can set up like some Zoom time. You know, you don't have to show up in my office, you don't have to wait for the office hours. That's the best if you need it. If on the other hand, you know, you already know what your type one project is and you want to write it, you can just write it down. But even if you haven't completely specified what it is uh, and you need to talk to me, I suggest that you put like a placeholder in the piazza as to what the paragraph description was about. So that I know at least you're thinking about it. Any questions? Okay. So, uh, okay. so um, continuing, and I don't know why this happens, but it happens. So we're still in the last part of this part. I'm hoping to get to the temple planning, but actually you'll notice that the Danjar Hafner thing essentially gets you one other important thing is that, as I mentioned already in the beginning of the class, it really makes you think about model free versus model based learning in other words. And, and the tricky problem is model free versus model based trade offs are not obvious in, you know, basically micro horizon, um, short horizon continuous learning based tasks. 
Okay. Um, so, as I said, this picture is what I use, you know, in my talks on like bridging planning and RL. And really, there is, in some sense, they are a common problem, but the details can make the problem look very, very different in practice. Okay. So, if you are looking mostly at these kinds of tasks in one type, you know, the continuous RL, and then you look at these kinds of tasks. Um, in like long horizon planning, most of the time, um, where essentially mission planning stuff are, and so on, um, you need both. Essentially, you need to be able to, um, you know, uh, bridge that gap. Okay, and that involves typically, uh, you know, some notion of <coughs> abstracting from the sensory information. Okay. Um, Okay, um, so you already know, I mean, this is just to remind you that, um, remind you that, um, so the model-based RL, uh, basically RL just tries to learn the controller, which is the policy. Okay, by the way, policy means controller. Okay, um, whereas you can learn first a model, that is the transition dynamics, and then learn the controller. That's what model-based RL does. And there's certain kinds of techniques you can use for one. For example, if you have an approximate model, then you can use Bellman's algorithm to convert that model into an optimal policy. Whereas if you don't have the model, then you're essentially converting, you're learning the policy using some of the model three methods, like the Q-learning and the learning Okay, now, unless the model is being used to simulate and reduce the amount of like a physical fires, et cetera, model-based learning doesn't typically make much of a sense. Okay, and in the continuous dynamics case, honestly, in fact, this is the point that those of you who get into AI with me, I tell you that the classic model free problem is swimming. Nobody has any model that they are conscious of as to how to swim. But honestly, this is not much different from swimming. This is not gold head. This is essentially how to learn to walk. Okay, so from the people's perspective, these are classic model free tasks. Okay, so in a weird way, what Dr. Apple was saying is that there is some computational advantage if you learn something like a model that may not at all look like your model because you would have a model for this task. Did you understand what I'm saying? So if you're doing this for like blocks work, you do have a model for the blocks work. And you can say, did the system learn the same kind of model that I have? If, you, if this system is learning a model for walking, most of you don't have a model for walking that you're conscious of, certainly not Dennis, right? And, and so whatever you get is whatever you get. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so at that point, actually, it is, it is as far as from, from my perspective, from our perspective, it is a clear model free task, but somehow something like a model that it is using internally is just trying to show that it has some advantages. But the model it learns cannot possibly be the model that you would have in mind because you actually don't have models for this. What I'm saying, you don't have models for this. It's one thing saying I have a model, I'm not completely sure how to write it correctly, but I have no model. And I don't think any of us have models for swimming and walking. In that we are conscious of. And if we are not conscious of it, then we are not consciously going to be able to do any look ahead with that model. You understand what I'm saying? And long range planning and long range look ahead become very hard to do if, in fact, 
it was if you essentially this kind of model that this guy is learning essentially you never used it okay it's something that you want to kind of keep in mind okay um so yeah so the other thing is that if basically the, the way you may want to when you have model based learners you can essentially bias the learned model to be close to the representation at least of that you humans use. There's no reason as to why the model has to be empty. In fact, if you think in terms of blocks world in this context, then arms essentially would be starting with names of the action, the parameters they can take, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's extra inductive bias. And it's constructing the model in terms of that language. So the inductive bias is not just how do I go from images to another latent dimension? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So I think actually, when you have model based learners, actually, this model could also be initialized by humans. And they can initialize in different ways. They can initialize the partial domain model. Uh, only like the types of actions and the variables available, etc. And either which way you then construct the model that you are trying to learn during experience is going to be something that is constructed to what humans can make sense. Okay. Um, the other thing is that, as I mentioned, that you know, basically this. Um, this the, the bigger issue is that if you are learning models yourself from sensory information and you only care about the computation efficiency, then it is possible that you can come up with abstractions. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, Jan's uh, paper on Japa, I mean, that, the one that he is now very excited about on his, uh, you know, the thing, uh, I call it Japanese architecture. But uh, so it essentially is hoping to learn multi resolution abstracted version. Okay. Um, and, and of what it's seen at the sensory level. And that should be used for two different things. One is that abstracted version should actually improve its efficiency. If it doesn't improve its efficiency, why care about that? The other significantly important thing is we, in this whole class, talked about learning the model, but not learning the preferences. Pretty much these kinds of techniques have images when you are learning the preferences. And in fact, you can almost say preference learning, actually, I might, might give you two papers, one from the, what I would call, videos are space-time signal tubes, uh, preferences, okay? Um, and then where basically you are trying to, you have figured out how to walk, but then certain kinds of moves people like, certain kinds of moves people don't like. And they don't know how to articulate what they like. So the only thing you can do is show, not just a single image, a little, video excerpt. One video expert, another video excerpt. One video excerpt and another video excerpt. And say which one do you like more? That would be binary comparisons. And the humans will then have to give these comparisons. And then from that you can slowly learn what is a kind of walk that people seem to be paying good money to watch. <laughs> this is what I'm saying, because that's the kind of preferences they have. You understand what I'm saying? Now, that idea, again, doesn't work at all for, I have no reason to believe that it will work for long 
horizon planning. We already talked about the fact that even for dynamics, the ideas that work for micro horizon continuous dynamics don't work for the not necessarily work for the long horizon and vice versa. This is doubly so for preferences because in the case of preferences, it's not even just a snapshot, it is a tube of the sensory information that you have to share. And you say, tell me which one you like. So to kind of ask people, which five-year plan do you want? You need to make five-year plan videos, which will, I think, be five years long. <laughs> and then say, which one do you like? You understand what I'm saying? There are no humans who would get through that nonsense. So that's why we normally consider two five-year plans and symbolic features. Do you like at the end of five years a lot more money, GDP, and people can be unhappy during the five years? Or do you want people to have lots of fun, but at the end of five years, some other country becomes the super dominant power? We have anything you could have a preference on that, especially those of us who think we may not have more than five years left to say, let's have fun now. You know, I mean, that would be a preference. Right? My point is the same trade offs that I talked about for quarter learning are going to be there for symbol preference learning with additional problems because actually, with the symbol learning, humans are in the loop. And we have to, it's like, it's a preference learning. Humans are in the loop, and B, it's their preferences that you're trying to understand. Right? How do you deal with this problem? You know, environment, we didn't like the environment. We made a simulator for the environment. Humans, we don't mind, but the humans do. We being the AI agent doesn't mind, but the humans do. In fact, in the preference learning, Literature, which I make you read a couple of papers. Typically, what happens is is that <laughs> the number of if number of pairwise comparisons you may have to give just for you to figure out what kind of walking looks good in a small, you know, micro horizon. Okay, that's basically the whole entire talk thing, actually. The, I, mean, I don't know why this guy is not moving fast enough, but different kinds of walks and some are looking more graceful. And that's what I'm trying to figure out, essentially. Okay? The number of, you know, pay-wise preferences you have to give just for that is so high that there's almost a cottage industry. To say, you know, instead of the 2 million pay-wise comparisons, we can get by with just 1.9 million comparisons. <laughs> Good stuff, right? You reduce the number of comparisons. I'm not questioning it, it's reduced. But it's just a dumb, what looks to me like a dumb idea. Um, you know, because I don't think there are any humans who do this. Then comes the simulator trick. Hey, we already simulated away the environment. Why not simulate away the human? It's like what Lennon said you want to help the humanity, it's the people you can't stand. Okay, so we don't want people, so we put people simulators, which would be just a program. And the program doesn't care whether you ask it one million times or two and a half million times. It has no such thing as impatience. The only question would be, you know, how much GPU budget you have. So you converted what would actually be a human factors issue, which is getting preferences efficiently, into a GPU issue. I mean, so I'm kind of fond of saying that with enough, with enough, G, enough, enough layers, every problem can be converted into an electricity problem, essentially. It's just a question of how much LTD are you spending. Um, but the point basically is that, the point basically is that in, in, in this case, essentially it becomes, so one issue is of course that if there is entire work right now on simulation, learning, Learning human preferences through simulation, just as you know, which is like the other side of Danger as well. Danger doesn't care about simulation. He just basically, I mean, he doesn't care about preferences. He just basically wants to at least work. 
And if you start having preference on right ways of working, then that's extra piece. That's the learning of the R part. And remember, learning of the R should be extremely easy if you are in the world. But you are in simulator. And unless somebody you know, initialize the simulator with the right kind of a reward, and I remember we talked about this fact that there are theorems showing that complex trajectory preferences can still be compiled down into some reward function. Some reward function. But compiling it down is not at all obvious. So to actually get that reward function, you still have to get this input saying what you like and then convert it into a reward function. And that asking part, you can you know, short circuit it by making humans be simulators. And just like world simulators stop the agent from dying, because the simulator is always eroding by definition. World simulators stop the agent from dying. I would like to think that the human simulators stop humans from dying of boredom. Because if I'm being asked, you know, every three microseconds, what do you think? Do you like this? Do you like this? And I say, oh my God, the heck did I get into AI? And why did we have AI systems? And like so, so annoying. You see what I'm saying? So in fact, surprisingly enough, when I was at the AI safety workshop, people noticed that this kind of approaches won't scale. But if they do, then you can throw GPU at it. And so the question is, how do you get generalized human models? And there were serious people talking about, why can't we use GPT-3 as the human model? You're talking about AI and ethics. You don't know what is coming yet. <laughs> Because in trying to save the world, we are going to convert everything, especially the GPT-3 4chan would be extremely good simulator of humans in my mind. So we can use that and then get a large amount of, you know, that's, this is serious people thinking because it's not obvious how to make pay-wise comparisons scale to long horizon tasks. Because I said, two five-year plans cannot be compared. Five years plans cannot be compared by actually showing the videos of the five year plans because it just is not enough time in the world for any humans. Okay, um, so this is actually something else that you know is connected to the whole um, issue of uh, preference learning. Um, as you say, and one interesting question coming back again to that, by the way, uh, this was like a big knockdown, drag out uh, fight. Uh, discussion with Mudit yesterday. Um, and then so I tweeted this as a thread. So you please read that thread. You know, this is the part that I just talked about, the difference of learning. Uh, nobody else will understand, but hopefully you understood because I elaborated my tweet. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that's there. I'll give you two papers to read too that will actually kind of tell you the two different parts, different ways of learning. One symbolic and one um, no, yes, I, think. Yeah. Um, I mean, all I want you to understand is what the trade-offs are. Whether the trade-offs can be uh, overcome, you don't have to buy my biases. You understand what I I have my biases, okay? But I want to bring up the trade-offs because you may not have thought about it. And if you think, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I know that this data exists, but I have this cool idea whereby I can make pairwise comparisons work for long horizon planning tasks. Be my guest. Just remember my last name so that we can put it next time. But anyway, so okay. Um, yeah. So it, the, the, in general. In the model based aspect, I mean, this is something that we talked about in the beginning of the class, and that's sort of a background uh, theme with me. That if you're learning models uh, to also be interpretable, to also take preferences, to be advisable with the humans, then it's not enough that the models are just abstractions. They should be abstractions that humans understand. 
<laughs> one, two is. one is brainwash humans. <laughs> and by the way, this is not surprising. In fact, there's a beautiful thing that we were talking about other day that, you know, recommender systems overall goal is to show things that people like so that they will spend more time on the platform watching them. But if it, all you care about is spending more time on the platform, why learn what they like? Just tell them what they like. Which is basically what happens in the recommender systems. We, we actually, that the one, one of the biggest worries that you know, in the current uh, recommender system literature from the ethics community is all recommender systems change our preferences without our knowledge, because we don't know what our differences were. And Heisenberg's uncertainty principle holds for our preferences in many cases. I, I think we have, I did I have this discussion in the class that the polling part, like, you know, if you, when you are asking people, you know, polling is like a classic case in point, you know, when you do phone polling, the way you ask the question can change people's answer. And essentially, RL systems underlying the recommended engines figure this out. I mean, it's not that they're evil, they're just trying to optimize the, the, the performance function. Okay, so it is kind of important to understand that when you have the preferences aspect, um, if you're not actually taking the advice, then you may well be essentially changing. If one way is to change their preferences, the other is actually keep them in the loop and take care of Okay, and to do the advice, then you need to have some kind of a common model. Okay, one last thing I want to mention is even in the model learning scenarios, um, here's an interesting thing. So actually, yeah, Likun is like very, very interested in long horizon plan because I would too, if I'm starting from micro horizon control task for which things are working from sensory information right now, and I know that that's not enough, all the great examples that I have um, are about how do I do travel planning, how do I do like NASA planning, blah, blah, blah. You know, I need to make like a possible way to get from where I am to there. So his idea would be that essentially, so he basically is like, he's quote unquote, as I said, the JEPA architecture is something that tries to learn things at different levels of abstraction, it hasn't been implemented, it's just a, you know, it's currently a, a dream, <laughs> a vision thing. Um, and in fact, the only thing that actually is implemented according to that in, you know, in the most recent articles is Danija Ravner's type of one. And we already know what it is capable of providing right now. And even if it actually learns the abstractions, even if it learns the abstractions, it's not necessary that the abstractions would be common with the humans. That's an interesting question to keep in mind. Um, and, and, and the other thing is that he basically, in fact, I think when we were having this discussion about, I'm having like, I'm teaching you and I'm also teaching Twitter people. And so I don't know who I'm teaching what, but so there was this whole entire thing about RL basically. So there was this last week after the class, I did this saying that, you know, convinced me that there is any difference essentially between uh, RL based on simulator uh, and such, like I just said, an RL based simulator, RL based simulator is nothing but a sexier name for such. Change my mind, okay? And nobody can change my mind because that's true, okay? And and then of course the interesting thing is Jan jumps in and says, "Yes, he says that's true." And what you need is world models. That's what he's happy about. But the one point I want you to understand is I agree with that, except. People dealing with simulators think they are learning world models, they're doing model-based plan, model-based model. -based model. Danager Hefner is learning a model, a world model, but he's using a simulator. Okay, so in some sense, essentially what happens in all these um, model-based RL scenarios is if you have a simulator, which is already a stand-in for the domain, RL then finds a stand-in for the simulator. If it is model based. They're all models. The model of RL is the model of the, the model based RL's model is the model of the simulator. 
simulator is the model of the world. Okay, so that's kind of useful to keep in mind uh, that it's not just real world model. Okay, um, I don't know. So there's there are again the, the interesting thing is reading Daniel's paper um, and and writing a Stitch paper. You basically say that what is a prediction is very very different things. And you should be impressed that they are able to predict the next four frames using the latent uh, dimension reduction. That basically he learned, you know, he kind of abstracted to some latent dimension, which is well, you know, well considered. But you have no idea whether or not it makes sense, other than the fact that somehow with it certain metrics seem to be better. And so those are the metrics. Okay, um, so I think these are still very relevant things. And one of the interesting things is that for the, there is an entire sim to real. Thing where the simulator is good enough, the policy you learn on the simulator can hopefully just transfer also. And it's very much true for, especially, it seems to be a lot more true, especially for um, short horizon continuous control tasks. Okay. So one of the things we're talking about is that learning model abstractions is important, um, you know, eventually to either, if it's, it's even important for the preferences, but certainly important for the models too. Um, if you're learning from continuous sensor models and yet want to inf interface with humans, should you be abstracting the actions to high level actions in symbolic descriptions? Because basically, think in some symbolic descriptions. Um, note that Afner learns a latent space, but it's not related to the human's abstractions. And it's actually not also, it's a probably a minor technical point. He doesn't do any temporal abstraction. He does state abstraction, as far as I know. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things is if you look at HTM, it does both state abstraction and the temporal abstraction. So the actions also have abstract versions. If you're thinking about doing that, that gets to the last paper, uh, which is the Konidaris paper. And the Konidaris paper essentially is kind of the first step in the direction of learning temporal abstractions and symbols, and symbolic questions, okay? And so the way, um, you know, since you read this, you know that he's thinking strips actions are associated with options. That's like saying a high level task is associated with a task network. Your task network, you have an option. Okay, and uh, he's also thinking that the symbols are associated with classifiers over states, over continuous states. Or low level states, which basically makes sense because, as I said, there are like a you know literally million videos with literally million pictures with a red block on top of the green block, and they're all different in some unnecessary detail. But if I just basically learn a classifier which tells me whether red is on top of green, then it will put all those states essentially in an equivalence class. And so you're you know, kind of reasoning huge sets of states at the same time. Okay. Um, so that's basically what you're doing. The one thing that's actually interesting, and you know, you can go back and look at it, that he actually has a follow-on work where he tries to learn the symbols too. He says this paper, he says he wants to learn the symbols themselves. As to which abstract, which so the question about the symbols really is. I, I'm as okay, so notice the following thing. Symbol, we keep making this point that the vocabulary of the human and the vocabulary of the machine may not be the same. The most obvious interpretation of that would make me think of Shakespeare saying, you know, what's in a name? A rose by any name. Sound just as sweet. I don't know why I sweet, but okay. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not at all what I'm talking about. Essentially, there is no reason that 
you took the pixel space and abstracted something called a flower concept from the pixel space. All you were doing is essentially just trying to look for symbolic abstraction, look for higher level abstractions, to just optimize your performance. And I bet, I bet that that's actually happening in Dan Jasper. He doesn't care. His, his, his proof is that I do better with my model. How do you care? Why do you care? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not at all obvious. I'm not saying when the vocabulary is different, I'm not saying that it's like two different human languages. That's not at all what I mean. It is that, in fact, the very notion of objects and the relations may not exist. And yet, the system can do well computationally left by itself. But then somebody else has to talk to it, it becomes an issue. Yeah. So would this be like saying that if you have an image of a flower, you abstract it by saying, oh, it looks like there's green stuff behind it. And that's how it creates its own abstraction. Yeah, I don't know what it's I mean, but If I know what it does, then I can it <laughs> might find something yes, that we it don't. It can know. pretty much be anything. Okay. It can pretty much be anything. You know, my, my question is the following. Remember that picture that all of you have seen? Which basically, I, I don't have it right now, but you know, there's like a, a school bus with imperceptible noise added to the school bus. And all you bozos think it's still like a school bus you can get onto. But the machine learning system with 150 layers is even more sure that it's an ostrich than it was sure that the original thing is a school bus. You understand what I'm saying? Both things look like school bus to me, but the original school bus, it thought, okay, 85% you know, confidence is a school bus. And then I add some imperceptible noise. Then it says 99% confidence is ostrich and nothing at all. Otherwise, how do you explain this? If I ask you, please explain why you think it is an ostrich. The machine. What will it do? It will at best look for quote unquote saliency regions. The thing is, you tend to think saliency regions correspond to the objects that we are seeing. For that particular example to work, the saliency regions could be some arbitrary clumps of points here and there. I said, those are the points that made me think this is an ostrich. And you say, I keep looking at it, I still don't see an ostrich. That's the difference in learning different languages. And I can't be sure what they wind up learning. You know? So you are better off biasing them to learn languages that are close to others, or at least make them talk in our languages. Yes. This is why justifiable AI is becoming more and more relevant, where we want to know what it's learning and why it's learning what it's learning. And if we don't have that justification for its decisions or its plans, that becomes a problem. Again, the point, yes, yes. I mean, first of all, I don't know that the word justifiable is a new word. I mean, I know responsible AI. I have basically said that pretty much everybody in computer science is doing AI, yeah. and they are either doing hardware AI or like a, some other AI, security AI or something, and the rest of them are doing responsible AI. Why? Nobody knows what responsible AI is. So that means I might be doing it. Okay. Um, that's one of these unfortunate loaded terms which have no meaning, you know, like evacuous terms which has no meaning. It could have a good meaning, but you know, pretty much everybody says I'm doing responsible AI. Who would say that they're doing irresponsible? <laughs> 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 you know, so my just are you talking about explainable? That's better. You know, right. explainable. You. And explainability is very close to my heart. And in fact, yes, that's one reason. But it is also true that in certain cases, we don't care about explanations. In certain cases, we do. And this is like a big you know, battle, essentially, whether or not you know, explanations actually matter. You know, um, some people think that you know, if the machine is doing fine, why does it get missed? Why do you need to know why it is doing what it's doing? And then these are the people who are saying, let's hope AI yeah, will be safe. You know, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. But yes, that's one worry about explanations that people would like to know why. And, you know, that, that becomes a whole entire different discussion. I mean, I might have it, maybe I already had it here, I don't know. Um, but we want explanations even when we can't understand the explanations. Right, I mean, you go 
to the doctor. And the doctor says you have the following thing, and you need like a should be the operation tomorrow. And then you say, oh, she's fine. Don't say that. Nobody ever says that unless like they're like somehow like completely different kind of human model, GPT-3 human model or something. They would ask, why do you think I have this? Why do you think I would need this? They ask the question knowing fully well that they won't necessarily know whether the explanation is actually correct. And so the reason about explainability is it also brings up all sorts of other issues that explanations essentially are the way to change people, you know, people's mental models. And you, in some sense, make them feel better that your decision is in the right direction. And, uh, you know, if they understand suddenly medicine, like suddenly, like the, whatever nine years of medicine that this guy did to come up with this diagnosis, did they understand in this little explanation? No. And in fact, the explanation that they give to the hapless patient is very different from the explanation they give to their colleague when they say, hey, why the heck did you say that this particular operation is needed? They will talk in a different vocabulary. You see what I'm saying? I mean, yes, but explainability is connected, but it also has all, all these other issues. Um, okay. So then this is the Kanidaris symbols thing. And then there are several extensions possible for symbolic extraction, some of which Kanidaris did. And it's also close to my heart not for computational efficiency reasons. I know I know some of you are doing neurosymbolic AI thing. And I have I already said this in the class before that why are you doing neurosymbolic AI? Is it for efficiency or is it for communicative efficiency? Efficiency is an entirely different issue. And in fact, you know, if it, when you think of neurosymbolic AI and you think efficiency as the you know what you're getting by abstraction. Think Danijar Hafner's model. Do you learn any more from that model? <laughs> he doesn't even bother showing you the latent dimension. There is a latent dimension. And you know, you trust because the performance improves. That's it. You see what I'm saying? So that's the internal neurosymbolic justification. But there's a, a different external neurosymbolic justification, which is if you want to deal with humans. Respect of what you do, you need to still take advice in symbolic terms, give explanations in symbolic terms, because that's easier to do. For. And so, in fact, that's basically what you know most of our recent work is. You know, there are a couple of papers, maybe you'll make you read one of them, but you know, that's what we do uh, for the symbolic abstraction. That's one direction from Kodidari's work. We actually use the same sort of an idea, symbols become like classifiers. Except in the iClear paper, um, when the use, so it's a situation where the machine is essentially learning probably in a different vocabulary, in fact, RAM state vocabulary uh, for the, you know, for the Montezuma castle thing. Uh, the, and uh, and uh, then the human asks, the humans are thinking of, you know, you know, actions that make sense to them, and they think of a state being with objects. The interesting thing is that the RAM state essentially is like almost a hash signature, which generates this image. And the humans look at that image and say, there are these objects. This is the particular, there's a wall here, there is a ladder here or something. And they are asked questions in those terms. They won't ask questions in terms of, why is the 17th digit of your RAM state nine instead of four? They could, but they don't. They don't know what the heck is RAM state. But you spent your life doing, you know, you the AI agent spent life doing their thing in the RAM state. So when they ask, when they ask, um, why, why did you do this particular action as against some other action? That explanation would have to be in terms they understand. And so in the IPA paper, we kind of learn a local symbolic model. That's not being used to do the reasoning, but it's being used to go the explanation. And there are versions of that where we do that for the advice, taking that advice. Okay, so that's a, a different thing. Uh, and while we are at it, uh, the, the human simulators aspect comes in in terms of cooperation. A uh, lots of work currently in terms of just like the preferences, there is idea that 
machines cooperating with humans has become an important thing. In fact, at least one of you are doing a project on this. Um, and the normal thing that basically, again, deep reinforcement learning people do is let's convert the humans into a simulator. So that I can play with this imagined human 10 million times and learn how to cooperate with it. And if the real human is not like the human that you, you know, hopefully they are like the human that you train on, then you will cooperate with them. If not, you slap them. <laughs> is what I'm saying. So there is a name for it, it's called fictitious coplay. A simulated coplay between AI agent and a human stand-in, which is also a problem. It's not that it doesn't have advantages. There are certain things that you can do with it. But you do really need to know what the disadvantages are when you're using this. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions? As we go to metric temporal time, most no, so looks like a check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't make you ask questions, you need this thread. But... Okay. So I actually, let me just, I have 10 minutes, so, so fast that we can do a lot of things. Um, so I want you to change gears, go back to strips planning for a while, forget about all these you know, sensors, etc. You know, I want you to kind of understand this kind of a planning. I put, yeah, this kind of a planning. That's temporal planning. Actions have durations. We keep doing this, actions can have durations. And the real world has access to durations. I want you to kind of, I want to quickly read the beginning slides um, and uh, just to make you realize how many complications come just because actions are Okay, so I'm just going to read this. This is almost text slides. So the changes brought about the introduction of time into planning can be grouped into two categories changes brought by having metric time. So, in fact, it's typically called a metric temporal planning. That's like a generalization of script select. It's still deterministic, but the actions are duration. Okay. Um, and also there is metric time. And the part about the metric time basically means that there is an accepted clock time, like the way you live the over. Okay, so basically you can't just say, I did all the actions I'm supposed to do, and I showed up. I'm supposed to come to this class too. I showed up, it was 7:30, and nobody is in the class. No, you're supposed to show up at 1:30. And you change your you know rest of your world such that you can be here at one time. I certainly do. Right? So that's a an extra constraint. It's not just be in the class if you feel like it's be in the class at 1:30. And I can't just come into the class and change the time at 1:30. <laughs> right? It's not for me to change. 1:30 is a clock time. I don't get to change the clock. That changes a whole bunch of things because that allows for talking about exogenous events. How many of you have seen Back to the Future? The ending of Back to the Future depends on an exogenous event in metric temporal time because he knows exactly that at that particular point of time, a lightning will strike. Am I giving you a spoiler? <laughs> 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 year old movie, right? They know that exactly at that time the lightning was like it was there. He's just back to that to the thing that he's already seen, and so he just has to stand there. <laughs> his wire connected is shoot the car goes. He just thought, oh, well, there will be some kind of a lightning at some point of time. It is not going to help. You need to know when it comes so that you are ready. Right? That that it can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. For the class, it looks like a bad thing. You have to show up at one time. <laughs> but for Back to the Future, it's a good thing, right? Um, and in fact whole bunch of things that NASA does depend on exogenous time. It's like you essentially set yourself in such a way that you get like gravitational boost in certain passing object, for example, and stop that stupid asteroid. You know, I didn't do anything, nothing bad to us, but we somehow destroyed it. But anyway, um, so changes, that's one type of issues, metric clock time. And there's a clock with respect to which we can specify events. Changes brought by the duration to the actions, actions are no longer instantaneous. 
both are important. Notice that when you talk about SMDP, in fact, you should think in the back of your head how does SMDP compare to these kinds of characteristics. Okay. Um, without metric time, the plan has just a beginning and an end point. Metric time allows us to talk about all time points, intervals during the execution of the plan, and changes brought by the metric time itself include exogenous events, which is the back of the future likely. Okay. Deadline goals. You must come to the cars by 1:30. You must be done with your project, you know, description by Friday. Those are deadline goals. Okay, generative goals, which is you should be away for two and a half hours when cloud is flowing on and on and on. It's not enough just to be awake once in a while, because you know I'm standing here. I can see what you're seeing. It's very unfortunate. I have good eyesight. I can see what you're seeing. So you know, generative goals are. Across the entire class time, we okay. That's a duration, and also across the entire lifetime, we alive. <laughs> right. Um, so issues with the time continue. Durations of actions might be, and now if you talk about the duration of actions, they can be static or dynamic. That means you know that this action, the class, more or less, give or take a few minutes, takes exactly whatever. Gave us two hours, fifteen minutes, and then with the fifteen minutes, we just so two or thirty minutes shorter. Okay, that's a duration. It's not dynamic. Come to our group meetings; they are dynamic. We say one hour, and then you know, and then basically and until I feel as if if I don't go home, I won't get dinner. You know, we just keep on going. That's a dynamic, right? So approximately, uh, answer, and then the dynamic time essentially can also have uncertainty. So here's the mean value of the duration, and here is the variance around. Is that important? Right? Um, anybody who does train travel in India, for example, know, know that there is such a thing called you know train arrival and departure time. But that's so you know that it's like a huge like that. It's like a huge. Uh, so the first time I remember I went to Kyoto, which I'm missing a trip to Kyoto next week. I could have been gone there, but the first time I went to Kyoto, I was going to Kyoto from Nagoya, and there was our our uh, train was at uh, 3:05, and then I went to the platform, and there was a train at 3 o'clock, so I got into it. I was basically it was supposed to be a super fast train, but it was stopping super fast everywhere. And I said, "Why the heck is this stopping every way?" It turns out that is a three o'clock train, and it does leave at three o something, you know, three o one point five or something. And then the other train comes, and then that leaves at three o five. And because I was from India, I thought I'm sure the train will be there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm pretty happy. And so I got onto the slow train, and the fast train actually came behind me and probably passed me by. Okay, so these things basically mean that there is, you know, that one actually the the Swiss train. Basically, people say Swiss trains you can set your watch by. It. I mean, they actually are so punctual, and and then you know we have terms like Indian punctuality, are <laughs> <laughs> the West Coast punctuality. They essentially they say ten o'clock, but they only start at ten fifteen. But since I know that there's only ten fifteen, I go over ten thirty. So anyway, it's also that. <laughs> so the problem is punctuality is the only thing that is equilibrium solution. If you think other people will allow it you to be late, then you can then work on that to make it even later. And so never meet. Um, anyway, with instantaneous actions, action has just a before and after. Precondition must hold before, and effects will hold after. Curative actions have a before and after, as well as a during. You see what I'm saying, and so that preconditions may have to hold the entire duration, certain have to only hold in the beginning, and similarly the effects they might occur only at the end, or they might occur in the middle of the action. You see what I'm saying, um, and so you actually have to deal with that. Uh, when are the preconditions needed? Are they needed at a single point or over a duration? This becomes important. And when are the effects given? Are they uh, point effects or durative effects. This is effect that's just sort of held up, and then somebody else can bring it down. That's like I put the switch on, and then you can put it off. 
versus I hold the switch on for a certain amount of time. You understand what I mean? That's, a, that's like a durative effect, right? Um, so acceleration, for example, when you press the pedal, that's a durative effect. For, you, know, you help hold it in such a way that there's a rate at which the velocity increases, right? That becomes important. Um, then um, note that because actions have durations, they can have multiple effects on a single fluid at different times. That's kind of interesting. So normally actions will basically it's instantaneous. The fluid is maybe true before becomes false, or false before becomes true, or it just doesn't change. For a durative action, the fluid can become false, true, false, true, false, true during the action. Okay. Um, so it's like I can make fluent P true at start, false after 10 seconds, true again after 10 seconds, etc. A default assumption is to say that all preconditions are needed at the beginning and must hold during the entire action's duration, and that all effects will be available only at the end of the action. That's a default assumption. That's not true in general for durative actions. Okay. Um, then some other interesting issues we we'll look at this too. Durative actions being more pointed meaning to concurrency. There is this word called parallelism, and there is this word called concurrency. And they're used as if they're synonyms. You see what I'm saying? And in the case of point actions, there's not much of a difference. Two actions are parallel. Basically, there are two points. That means the points can be done. In, in, in fact, in the, in the strips parallelism, if I say two actions are unordered, What that means is there is a serialization order. And every serialization order should work. You know, this is actually like for those of you who have done databases, you talk about transaction serializability. And it's actually very, very, very important, it turns out. You guys don't realize, you know, it was like a big computer science at one point of time. When I was doing my qualifiers for my PhD, I had to read Leslie Lamport's paper on atomicity of database transactions and why, if that's not insured, while I'm trying to withdraw money from my, from my um, ATM, right? So there are like multiple pieces. When I say I want to take $100, so it needs to remove 100 from my balance, then it needs to send the $100 through that thing so that I can vote. Imagine it removed the hundred, but before it sent the hundred dollar note out, the power failure occurred. It can happen. So now I'm one hundred dollars less. So what they do in transaction atomicity is they make sure that the entire transaction is atomic. The whole thing either happens or doesn't happen. And if it doesn't happen, they can rewind it back. They realize that poor Rao did not get the money, and so they will add the hundred back to his balance. Otherwise, I would be a sad guy. Okay. Anyway, that a transaction atomicity, transaction serial. What transactions are required is that there is a every serialization is kind of correct. Okay. But actually, when you have durative actions, I can have this much of an action and I have a small action today. And they're done being done concurrently. You know, for example, you're breathing through the whole day, one action, and then you're also sitting in the class during the day, that's another action, and you're concurrently sitting in the class while breathing. And it's not that you'll breathe and you'll sit in the act class and you'll breathe and you'll sit in the class. That's serializable. Okay, so concurrency actually has a true meaning in durative actions. And one of the interesting things we'll find when we come back next class is that the first ideas for solving temporal planning problems would be to just use strips planning and act as if the actions, you know, basically use the quote unquote configuration space like ideas in robotics. Act as if the actions are point actions, even though they have durations, think of the duration as if it's some kind of a cost. And do normal strips planning. And then after you get a plan, then you can do some post-processing step to make the make span smaller. Now we might ask what the heck is make span. 
Next span is for any reasonable project planning. How many of you have heard of project plans? You know, if you have a project plan, like for example, making a you know, building or something, they have tons and tons of things, and it's a huge concurrent plan, and they basically estimate and tell you that we will be done with the building and you can open it on April 7th, for example. So that's the next step. From today till when the actual, the earliest time when the entire plan is completed, execution. The interesting question is, next span is the same as the, if you have unit actions, and they're all serial, the mix band basically is the same as the number of units of actions. So you can think of this thing that if the mix span of the plan is, if you have like, um, I would tell you that a plan contains actions A1 to A10, each with durations D1 to D2. The minimum mix span this plan can have is the max of D1 to D2. You see that? Because you know, even if all the actions are parallel, the longest action still has to get done before the entire action is done. So max span of P will be max of D1 to D10. That's the best you can ever get. And because of precondition effect dependencies, because of conflicts, the max span actually can be much higher than max of D1 to D10. Okay, um, you can say if the next span is equal to the sum of D1 to D10, then it is a strictly serial plan. I mean, you're doing one thing, the next thing, the next thing, next thing, and then you're done. Okay, and if the next span is greater than sum of D1 to D10, then there is idle time in the plan, there is slack. Slack is important. Because, you know, in fact, good plans for giving temporal robustness will build in slack. You always give yourself extra time um, when you go to the airport, you know, because you don't know, you know, what sort of crazy thing can happen. And so you give yourself some slack. And the slack can be the difference if, if you, if the, in fact, the world, if you have the correct world model, if you have the world model that's perfect, then Using Slack means you're being inoptimal. Putting Slack, on the other hand, is your admission saying that I'm not so sure of my world model. There can be exogenous events, there can be wrong, um, you know. And putting Slack is the way you make the plan work. For more, if, you know, if you have a model, typically it is one of many possible models. There's a distribution over them. You pick just one and did planning with it. But the plan you want, you want it to work on the whole distribution. This kind of an idea is considered robust planning. When was the last time you heard robust planning? Thank you. Very first lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Very first lecture. Right? And you get robust planning. One way of getting robust planning is actually building in Slack. And if next plan is less than sum of D1 to D10, then I say the plan has concurrency. It must have concurrency. That means there must be certain instants of time when more than one action is in progress. And the interesting thing is in, you know, in strips planning, if there is a solution um, at the, at, you know, with action parallelism, there's also a solution with sequence of operators. Because of which I believe I told you that the refinement planning semantic assume that the potential solution in the end is just a sequence of operators. And in fact, the, you know, that sequence of operators and then basically each partial plan is a set of sequence of operators. And the progression is going by constraining the prefix, and regression is going by constraining the suffix, plan space planning is going by just putting general constraints on the operator sequences. But remember that I thought the final solution is just an operator sequence. It turns out that operator sequences may not be able to solve a problem if, in fact, the problem requires concurrence. So parallelism can be a computational efficiency thing. I can use that parallelism to get done faster. Our parallelism or the concurrency can be required. And so when required concurrency, for example, would be, would be there if you wind up happening um, 
you wind up happening, you wind up having uh, scenarios where you are crossing a you know a dark a dark uh, basement uh, to change the fuse, and you strike a match to see where you are going. And the strike, the match should be on the whole time you are walking to the switch. That's a required concurrence. And then the last slide, this is the slide I'm going to show you, that it turns out that there is a version of PDDL that you know and love that allows for describing actions in this more general type. It can, for example, talk about actions the duration, the conditions, and then the effects can be at different points as well as over durations, at start effect, at end effect, and at duration. And then similarly, the preconditions can also be at start and through the entire action. So there's actually a PDL 2.1 model where you can write temporal planning domains like this, and then you can solve planning problems in this model. NASA actually does that mostly and it's machine learning because there is no such thing as non duration actions. Okay, so when we come back, I'll make you look at some temporal planning stuff, you know, in the textbook level. I'll also discuss uh, the temporal planning with the model and the algorithms. I might also make you read one, two papers on reference. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there is an attendance sheet somewhere. Who has that attendance sheet? Oh, there it is. <laughs> 